time as we're coming back to our buildings that some people are going to be choosing to stay and wait and watch at home. So uh, we have to be prepared for knowing that numbers will fluctuate from week to week. But for those of you who came today, we are so glad that you are here. We have just a couple of announcements. Uh, this upcoming week, we will be preparing for next Sunday when we will be doing communion together. Um, we are working on the safe practices of all that, but do know that we will be sharing communion together next week. So that will be an exciting thing. And as always, if you are not able to be with us in person, um, when you do have that come uh, and you watch at home, know that you may use your own elements at home. Uh, in addition to that, I just wanted to do a quick update on Trisha before I forget. Uh, Trisha has come home from the hospital. She's resting and recuperating, gaining some strength. Um, she was very severely dehydrated, so they, uh, they have her in tip-top shape. So we're, we want to keep her in our prayers. All right, and now let's prepare for worship. Um, who was my person that was ringing the bell? My bell ringer should be up here by now. <laughs> it's one of mine. Here we go. He's coming. We don't want to forget the bell. It's beautiful. Thank you, Caleb, for being willing to do that. Do not wait. Waiting is too hard. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for God. But we do not wait. We say that we don't have enough time. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for God. Be still before the Lord. Be still. Wait patiently. And now we're going to be blessed with our Linda playing our first hymn this morning, O Blessed Spring. of time you know the meaning of waiting for you have waited on humanity since the beginning of creation teach us made in your image how to wait how to be patient with stillness how to trust in your timing amen and our scripture this morning is the old testament is genesis 29 14b through 20. You are my own flesh and blood. Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, 
Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. And now we'll be blessed with some special music. Ryan, can you boost mic uh, four? Mic four. We'll try that once more. the gift she has. We miss her in person. She started a job and uh, cannot be with us every Sunday anymore, but that was beautiful. All right, and now uh, Marie has for us an epistle lesson. Yes, it's found in Romans 8, 18 to 28. Consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that he cre the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the fir first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption 
as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he, know, he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Marie. And now, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. I don't know how many of you remember this, but I have had the privilege over the last month to six weeks of doing some special Christian education lessons with Marie's grandchildren. What a wonderful grandma Marie is, and it just is very, quite fitting that she's right up here today doing liturgist here for us. She packs all four of the kids with their masks into their car and drives them all the way here for us to have those special lessons. All four, I said. Now, it would be challenging enough to do that with one or two grandkids. How she manages with four is beyond me. They have all kinds of energy, so much so that when I get home, I have to lie down flat on my back for about a half hour. It's the funnest thing. I love it. <laughs> but boy, do they have energy. Well done, Marie. Well, just this past week, we began our newest segment of lessons on our founder of Methodism, John Wesley, and his family. And in fact, the kids are transforming some plastic bottles into wonderful characters from the Wesley family. They will finish up soon and I hope to find a way to share them with you all in worship because they really are adorable. Well, I share this with you because I find that every time I teach about John Wesley, I learn more and more. Well, as we've been learning about John Wesley and the Methodist beginnings, I was reminded of one of his journal writings. The entry was from Saturday, March the 4th. Wesley wrote of a conversation he'd had with his good friend, Peter Bowler. This was just after his Aldersgate experience when his heart was strangely warm. He understood now something that had been missing in his life as a Christian. For so long, he had believed that he had to try harder to be good, to become a better person of his own merit. But after Aldersgate, Wesley understood God's amazing grace. By faith alone we are saved, not by works. But like all of us, Wesley even sometimes struggled a bit with his faith. He wondered, what about when we struggle with having faith? How could he preach faith to others when he was personally struggling to have it? So he asked his friend Peter, if he should perhaps stop preaching for a bit until he had a strong faith once more. His friend's response was recorded in this entry from Wesley's journal. By no means, said Peter, preach faith until you have it, and then because you have it, you will preach faith. <laughs> Isn't that a great saying? I'm going to say it one more time. Preach faith until you have it, and then because you have it, you will preach faith. Well, faith is not a struggle for myself right now, but I'll tell you what, the same principle applies, I believe, for other issues. And I don't know about you, but the one I'm struggling with right now is patience. <laughs> We've been at this a long, long time, haven't we? with things the way they are. And I don't know about the rest of you, but my patience I have seen 
is starting to grow a bit thin. I suspect that I'm not alone in that. Haven't we all been running on empty when it comes to patience? So I decided then that for our next sermon series, we'll take a look at some pictures of patience from the Bible. And may we all be inspired, as Wesley said, preach patience then until you have it. And that's what I'm going to try to do over this series of the next few weeks. May we all be inspired to have a bit more patience by looking at these stories from the Bible and our biblical saints. So we begin this new series today with the patriarch Jacob. Now Jacob's story, of course, is found in the book of Genesis. He was the grandson of Abraham and the son of Isaac and Rebekah. Jacob, you may recall, was a twin. In the 25th chapter of Genesis, verse 26, we read about his birth. He came out grasping the heel of his brother Esau. He was holding right onto it. So Jacob was given a name because of this. Jacob means he grasps the heel. Now, interestingly, this expression to grasp the heel happens to be a Hebrew metaphor for being a deceiver or one who would take advantage of another person. I don't want us to miss that. His name was a metaphor for a deceiver or someone who would take advantage of another. And talk about living up to your name. Wow. Further on in the chapter, Jacob patiently waited for the opportunity to deceive his brother Esau. He took advantage of his hunger one day and stole from him his birthright. Then in Genesis chapter 27, Jacob deceived his own father Isaac in his elderly years in order to gain his father's blessing and steal it away from his brother Esau. Now you can imagine once he had done this to his brother Esau, he needed to flee from his wrath. Now those happen to be two negative examples of having patience because Jacob used his patience for trickery and self-gain. But we get to Genesis 29, 20. And we see that example of patience that Jacob is probably best known for when Jacob waited patiently to marry the woman he loved. After tricking his brother out of his birthright and the family blessing and going on the run, it is understandable why his brother was out to get to him. So he fled far away to the land where his uncle Laban lived. There he fell in love with the younger of Laban's daughters, Rachel. And I think verse 20 is one of the loveliest verses in all of scripture to describe human love. It says, so Jacob served Laban seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Seven years, that is a long time. I don't know many people who would wait seven long years in order to be with the person they fell in love with. That would take a tremendous amount of patience. Jacob had patience. He was perfectly content to do so in order to be with the love of his life. Of course, the story continues with what our Marie read for us today and how the trickster himself was tricked by his own father-in-law. And after working those seven years for Rachel, his father-in-law partied with him late into the night in celebration. Then Laban masterminded a switcheroo for the honeymoon. By the time the sun rose the next morning, Jacob found himself needing to serve Laban another seven years in order to marry the love of his life. That's a total of 14 years. Now that's a picture of tremendous patience. Now he didn't have to wait those seven years to be with Rachel. But still, he was promised to work for his father-in-law. But 
what did he do in that 14 year time span as he waited patiently that we could perhaps glean some insights from? Well, the first thing that Jacob did as he waited patiently was he deepened his relationship with God. It was because Jacob had strengthened and deepened his relationship with God in that time that he was able to hear the voice of God speak to him over the course of those years. It was because Jacob listened to what God told him to do and was obedient to that, that God blessed him with flocks, herds, and much good fortune. So much so that by the time he returned to his homeland and met his brother Esau, whom he had wronged so very badly, Jacob had learned some valuable lessons. And that is the second thing that Jacob did as he waited patiently over those 14 years. He allowed God to do a mighty work in him. Jacob recognized the wrongs he had committed against his brother and his brother. Not only did he recognize the sins he'd committed, but he wanted to make amends for the wrong he had done to his brother when he was young. In Genesis 32, we have the story of Jacob meeting Esau for the first time after so many years. His peace and reconciliation offering consisted of 220 goats, 220 sheep, 50 cattle, 50 donkeys, and 30 female camels with also their young. That's a whole lot of livestock. Precious flock. What does all this from the story from Genesis have to do with us today in our predicament in a pandemic that has seemed to go on forever? We're impatient. This has been a very long time. But we've not had to wait seven years, never mind 14. So there it is, some hope in and of itself. Let's follow Jacob's lead at such a time as this. While we wait for life to get back to a normalcy, and things to be able to be what we remembered so long ago, we should not be idle or passive. Jacob shows us two very positive and, two, and very beneficial things that we can do as we wait. First, let's deepen our relationship with God. Jacob began a very active prayer life in that time. He spoke with God, and he listened for God's voice speaking to him. And we need to do the same in times that are difficult, in any time, whether it's a difficult time or, or not. We should be in communion with God through prayer. Not only should we be giving God our requests, but listening for God's still small voice of guidance. God will answer our prayers. Now second, Jacob used that time to look back over his life. He recognized the things that were wrong. We might say he did some spiritual house cleaning. Where he saw sin, he repented, and he sought reconciliation. Now that's a real plateful. No doubt Jacob needed those 14 years to do all that work. Let's pray. We don't have to wait that long. But in the meantime, while we do still wait, let's follow his lead. As we struggle with patience, let us self-reflect. Where there is sin in our lives, let us repent. Where there has been wrongdoing, let us seek reconciliation. And where we have put our desires before God's wishes, let us clear away that clutter and remember to put God first. Friends, if we can focus on these things in this season of impatience, I can promise you that God will be as faithful to us as he was with Jacob. 
If we make the commitment to deepen our relationship with God by praying more and listening more, God will be faithful and we will grow spiritually, gaining the patience that we lack. And if we're brave enough, like Jacob, to speak, to seek out the sin in our lives and repent of it and seek reconciliation to those we have wronged, God will be faithful. Oh, the work will be difficult, but we will not be alone. Like Jacob, we may wrestle with God, but when the sun rose the next morning after Jacob did wrestle with God, Jacob walked from that point on with a limp, a reminder that God was with him always on this journey of life, even in the times when it was hard to be patient. So your homework this week, your homework is to increase the amount of time that you spend in prayer with God and the time that you spend listening for God's still small voice and to look back and think about how we can use this time when we're all so impatient to get out and get doing the things that we want to do. How can we find the, thing, the people that we have wronged and seek reconciliation? Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, it is so, so hard to have patience at such a time as this. But we thank you, Lord God, that your word is filled with examples of people who have come before us who have had the same struggles. So, Lord, we pray that we can learn from them. Help us this week, Lord, to increase our time in prayer and our time in listening. Change our hearts, oh God. Help us seek those opportunities where we can repent of where we have made wrongs against another, that we may seek reconciliation and restorative justice as Jacob did. And now, Lord God, we lift up all of those prayer needs that we have among our church family and in our nation and in our world. We remember Trisha and pray for her continued healing. We pray for Jean's continued healing, that she will soon be able to walk 100% again. We pray for all who are sick and all of those in need of care. We remember, Lord, all of those who went down on the submarine, and we pray, Lord God, for their families with such a difficult loss as the, the boat has yet to be found. Lord, we take just a few moments to say some silent prayers in our hearts for the people we love and our community, our nation, and our world. We thank you, O oh God, that not only do you hear our prayers, but you answer them. And now let's pray together the prayer the Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We want to thank all of you who have supported us financially and continue to do so. And um, we remember the words of John Wesley, our founder. Make all you can, save all you can, and give all that you can. There is a red bucket there. If you should want to drop off offering today, you may do so after the service. And now it's time for our final hymn, and Linda is going to bless us playing Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
go into the world this week and uh, deepen your prayer line. Seek out the opportunities to reconcile with others and know that you are not on that phone. God is with you, and we pray this in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.